Good afternoon, morning. No, it's morning here. It's morning here and afternoon in Jerusalem. Uh, thank you all for joining. If you're wondering why can't I see myself or turn on my microphone uh, with the, the number of people that are participating, we wanted to make sure that we could stay focused uh, in our conversation with Yossi, but we do want you to participate. So, and I'll repeat this a few times. Hopefully we've all become quite good at, at Zoom out of necessity over the last few years. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll do our best uh, to triage those. Rabbi Brown and I are here with Yossi Klein Halevi, who is in Jerusalem. Yossi is our Temple Shalom resident scholar for the year and was just here in Vancouver. It seems like a lifetime ago. Um, oh boy. You know, when we were talking about all sorts of other existential crises and threats and not to make light at all in any way of the current situation. Um, so Yossi, well, first of all, we're just glad to see you and to know that you are safe and hope and pray that you and your, your neighbors and your family are as well. But we know that, that the whole of the Jewish people and in particularly in Israel are feeling quite unmoored, quite unsafe right now. And uh, it's, a, it's a terrifying moment, uh, in, in the most so in my lifetime. Uh, and, uh, and maybe you can reflect on, on just sort of what's the mood like in Israel right now? We'll get into how we got here, where we go, what's happening, but, but what's it like on the ground right now? Well, first of all, hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be back with all of you. And as you say, Rabbi, it was, uh, it feels like a lifetime ago, but it was a month ago that uh, I spoke uh, at the temple about the threat to Israeli democracy. And we were out in the streets trying to save our democracy. And now we're trying to save the country. And what was so extraordinary uh, was the immediate shift, the way <clears throat> Israeli society was able to pivot instantly from the most divided that we've ever been in in our history to this natural state of unity. And, you know, many of us are still seething at, at our government. Uh, we've never gone to war in a situation where so many Israelis have such little trust in our leaders. And yet, what I think is so extraordinary about this moment is that we're not waiting to be inspired from above. When, when I see Netanyahu, uh, on, I, I just tur I turn, turn the screen off. <laughs> I can't listen to him. And I know so many people who feel that way. And yet it doesn't matter because we all know what we need to do as Israelis, as Jews. And we're going to war despite our leadership. Yeah. We mobilized ourselves. And the fact that, that the protest movement took all of its resources and energy and immediately the day after the 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 massacre went down south and opened up this extraordinary center for for uh collecting aid for dealing with the uh for offering psychological help to the survivors for evacuating people it wasn't the government that did this this government is so like, unbelievably incompetent it was the protest movement and so We've never been in a situation like this. This is there's something surreal about this moment. And yet, in a certain sense, I feel that this is the greatest moment for the people of Israel. Because it's the moment of our maturation, mm -hmm. precisely because we have no leaders. We have no one we can trust, but we trust each other. And we're we've organized ourselves. I've never seen Israel react so spontaneously and effectively with the government in such total disarray. So it's a it's a schizophrenic moment. It's 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 we've never we've never seen anything like this. I don't know of any society that's been in this situation. You know, look at Ukraine. Look at the magnificent and inspired leadership that they have. And. I, I can't bear my government. But it turns out that I don't need them to know mm -hmm. what I have to do. So so I, I so I'm I'm speaking now about, about my mood, about the mood of 
very large numbers of Israelis. But what I what really unites all of us at this point is um is the next couple of days because it seems to me that the ground offensive is going to begin within the next two or three days. And everyone here, everyone I speak to has two opposite feelings. One is this deep sense of fear about what it means to get stuck in Gaza. Can we really do what we need to do, which is destroy Hamas? And the other feeling is we have no choice. We have to do this. Mm -hmm. And so everything, everything is just, we, we're just torn apart. And yet we're able to compartmentalize. I think that's the 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 extraordinary resilience of this moment. Yes, yes, I despise my government. I love my country. Uh, yes, I'm desperately afraid of a ground offensive. And all of the warnings that we keep seeing in the op-ed pages, we all feel that. Mm -hmm. But what, what all those warnings are missing is one crucial point, which is we must restore our deterrence. And if we don't hit back decisively and try to bring Hamas down, we will have lost our deterrence in the Middle East, and that will have long-term existential consequences. Yeah, Micah Goodman uh, had a podcast on Times of Israel. He put it in, in, in a way as preparing for this ground offensive that he knows that the the headlines are going to be just brutal in the West uh, as uh, as the you know as the collateral uh, the civilian casualties crop up, and he says that Israel needs to be loved in the West and feared in the East. That that's yeah, the, that's, a great that's the dynamic, and it's very hard to do those things. Um, I, I I so first of all, again, if you have questions for Yossi, please put them in the chat. Um, I I guess just building on what you had said, Yossi, because the thought of a nation going to war without its political leadership um is it, it, just and i'm not a military you know strategist in any way but it just it just seems almost impossible to me can can israel do this is there confidence in the idf i mean we we, we look at what happened on october 7th and 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 wonder you know because that was the most trusted institution that was the one that everybody was relying upon and and it seems that that there was even a breakdown there can can israel do what it needs to do is there confidence how do you do this without political leadership? I'll, I'll give you my answer, and I think it's it's a fairly common mm -hmm. sense, and that is, I can't ask that question. Mm -hmm. It's the only IDF I have, mm -hmm. and we're going to find out. And I I have to believe that the army can handle threat. It was caught unprepared. It was caught because of disastrous, um, a, a disastrous, um, we call it in Hebrew, a conceptia. <laughs> and it's it's hard to really translate that. It's not quite a conception. A conceptia is much deeper than that. It's 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 a uh, it's a worldview. It's a it's and and the conceptia that failed us was that Hamas is weak. Hamas has no interest in trying to take us on for yet another round. And so the army moved almost all of its soldiers to the West Bank. The Gaza border was almost completely open. Now, the, the, the question that I have, and I have not seen an answer to this, is what took the army so long to get back to Gaza? Mm -hmm. It's not that far. Mm -hmm. And I can't allow myself deeply into that question because I don't want to know the answer. Mm -hmm. And so we have we have something like 350,000 reservists sitting on the border now. Uh, I don't think we've had that kind of an army since 1982, since the first Lebanon war, uh, maybe not since the Yom Kippur war. Mm -hmm. And um, the motivation and um, of the soldiers is extraordinary. There's there's the morale, the the anger, the determination, and 
I have to believe that we have officers who will know how to channel that. So, you know, anyone who I speak to here and I ask that question, can we do it? The answer is we have to do it. No choice. We're, we're, we're back in that old Israeli mindset, which was defined in the early years of the state by the expression Ein Brera. There's no, there's no alternative. And Ein Brera kind of went the way of, of, of archaic language uh, after the Sadat visit. And we realized, well, maybe we do have an alternative. Mm -hmm. And we're back. We're back in Ain Brera. Mm -hmm. You'll see, I'm wondering if you can share with us a little bit about um, kind of this emergency government that came together and how, you know, the civilian population has come together and united and there's been this attempt politically, but what does that really mean in terms of, of leadership and um, how, how Israelis are responding to, to the government? Look, there's a great relief, I think, on the part of almost everyone here, regardless of their politics, that we have a semblance of a unity government. It's not a full unity government. Yair Lapid has chosen to remain outside. And I actually think it's the right call. I think that I'm, I'm very grateful for Benny Gans and, uh, and Yvette Lieberman for going into the government. And, and I'm equally grateful for Yair Lapid for staying out because there needs to be some voice speaking the truth about Netanyahu and his culpability. And um, look, everyone knows that Netanyahu is in survival mode. And it's a terrible thing that I'm about to say to you, but the survival mode that Netanyahu is in is not the survival mode that the rest of us are in. He's in his own political survival mode. And I don't believe that my prime minister is placing the interests of the country before his own interests. I don't believe it. Uh, there was a picture yesterday that appeared all over social media of uh, Netanyahu and President Herzog standing at the airport waiting to greet Biden, to shake his hand. And Netanyahu is pushing Herzog away. He wants to be the first to shake Biden's hand. Now, according to protocol, Herzog is the president. He's supposed to shake President Biden's hand first. Netanyahu pushes him away. The hashtag uh, on that picture is this is Netanyahu, this is Netanyahu at war. And so I have no expectations that he's going to rise to the occasion. But the fact that that there are credible people now sitting in government, and in addition to Benny Gans, who of course was the commander of the IDF, he's brought in um, Gadi Eisenkot, who was the previous commander. So we have two former IDF commanders in chief sitting in the war cabinet. Uh, and uh, Yvette Lieberman, who is a former defense minister, uh, is now part of the circle as well. So that gives me a measure of reassurance. If they were not at the table, I don't think we'd be able to go to war. We could not go to war with the Likud and Ben Gvir and Smotrich and the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox. It's inconceivable that the government that brought us the greatest disaster in Israel's history, including the Yom Kippur War, would lead us with that same format, that same that same composition would lead us into, into the war. So there is this sense of, of, of some relief. But um, as, as I say, we've never been in a situation like this where there is absolutely no trust for the prime minister. Extraordinary. And you know, there's there's a debate going on within the protest movement. Do we demonstrate now? And most people feel that this is not the moment. And I, I certainly agree with that. Uh, then there's a question of, should we be demanding Netanyahu's resignation? And there's the precedent of uh, Churchill replacing Chamberlain. 
Mm-hmm. And if we had a Churchill in in the Likud, because that's where his replacement would, would have to come from, then I would say we should push. But there's nobody in the Likud. Absolutely nobody. Netanyahu has succeeded in, in destroying the party of government. So we're going to get through this one way or another with the current constellation. And, uh, and as I say, there'll be the reckoning the morning mm-hmm. after. So, Yossi, you, you, you say that you, it appears that the ground offensive is going to begin imminently. Uh, and you've written about this a bit. And I know that the Hartman uh, Foundation, uh, the Hartman Fellowship has done, not fellowship, Hartman Center um, has institute, has done some writing on this as well. The moral question. Can, yeah. can you talk about that and how Israel does this? Um, again, needing to be loved in the West, feared in the East, and most of all, needing to survive. But 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 the moral question. So let's let's use as a template the incident that happened uh, yesterday or two days ago with the hospital. You know, I I it's I, I've lost track of time. It uh it it just feels time feels so malleable, and um, I I I never remember what day it is. I have no idea what date it is, and. Um, so whenever whenever the hospital mm-hmm. event was, that's a really good example of uh, of what to expect in the coming weeks. we We made what I consider to be an open and shut case that Israel didn't do it. And yet the media is still referring to this as, as, uh, as an incident that's in dispute. Hamas has offered absolutely no evidence for its claim that this was uh, an Israeli attack. When Israel, when, when you bomb from the air, there's a, there's a big crater that's formed. There was no crater. And, and for me, it's so, it's so self-evident that it wasn't us. But there are two points here that, that I think are important to make. One is the way that the media responded. And the second is, it could have been us. It could have happened. And my response to that, and 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 the the, the deep fear that I have, which we all have here, is that something like that is going to, God forbid, is going to happen. For me, there's one overriding question. Was it done deliberately or accidentally? Now, obviously, to the people who are killed in, in an attack, it doesn't matter. But intent is the is the precise difference between between war as tragedy and war as barbarism. And as long as our intent is to avoid civilian casualties, we must proceed with the war. Now, when the ground force begins, well, let, let, let me back, let me let me take a step back. As long as this is a an a a, a, a a war that's driven by the Air Force, and that's what it's been until now. I am confident that we are trying to avoid civilian casualties. That's what the Air Force does. There, there isn't this personal um, interaction with civilians on the ground. The Air Force, it's it's all um, it's all done um, in a in a in a very technical way, and and. And that's that's good because it's done in a professional way. The policy is avoid civilian casualties, and I trust the Air Force completely. As soon as you bring in ground forces, you're bringing in a cross section of Israeli society, and there will be people in going into Gaza who will try their best to avoid civilian casualties. There will be others who frankly won't care one way or another 
They won't go out of their way to kill civilians. They also won't go out of their way to protect civilians. And there are always a few who are wild cards. And bear in mind that 300 plus thousand Israelis, traumatized, enraged Israelis, most of whom know someone personally or know someone who knows so. We all are are one are one step removed from from knowing people who've been kidnapped, people people who were killed. That's that's almost universal here. And and even if you don't know someone personally, the rage. And I'm worried. I'm really worried. Do I trust the army? Basically. Do I trust the entire army? No. No. I don't think any army in this kind of situation could be fully trusted. So I'm worried. Does that mean that we shouldn't go in? Of course not. I mean, then that means we can never defend ourselves. But uh, to tell you that that oh, we're the most moral army in the world, and, you know, trust us. I, I can't say that. In, in, I think we're in a, uh, in a very delicate, very delicate place. What is it, Carrie? I was just saying, we're starting to get some, some good questions in the chat. Um, and I want to ask one and add a, a little extra question of mine on top of it. Um, so this is from Bob Wilmot, and he asks, uh, he says, the IDF priority has to be Gaza, but will anyone in government be paying attention to managing the rage in the West Bank? Um, and on top of that, I'm curious to know, too, what, what is the temperature among um, Israeli-Palestinian citizens right now? I just had a long talk today with the, um, the person who is in charge of uh, the Hartman Institute's uh, shared civil society initiative. Uh, she's Palestinian Israeli. And it was a terrific talk. It was so much pain. And, and Palestinian Israelis have responded overwhelmingly with horror. Palestinian Israelis, Arab Israelis, you can use whatever terminology seems right to you. Uh, something like 80% uh, in a poll were outraged. That's good news, bad news. 20% <laughs> is a lot of people. And uh, to think that that 20% of the uh, of Arab citizens in some way identify with this is, is really worrying. But we do have 80% of our fellow citizens who are Arab, with whom we can speak, with whom we can try to envision some shared future. What does it mean to be Israelis together? A very difficult identity to share. And it's getting more difficult by the day as the casualties mount in Gaza. Now, the way Jewish Israelis processed the hospital is different than the way Arab Israelis processed it. Uh, we did not feel guilty. We, I think, I think almost all of us knew we didn't do it. And I think many Arab Israelis believe that we did. Certainly what they hear in, in, in Arabic media reinforces that. And so, uh, so I think that, that, you know what what so what I heard today from my friend at, at Hartman was um the shock at the barbarism, the the gratuitous cruelty. This is the mirror that's that was held up to um to the Arab world, to the Muslim world. And Arab Israelis reacted much better, it seems to me, than many Canadian Muslims did. And anything yeah. on the uh, the West Bank? Yeah, on the West Bank. Yeah, yeah. 
Look, in the West Bank, I'm worried about two things. I'm worried about Palestinian terrorism and I'm worried about Jewish terrorism. And can we control both while we're fighting in Gaza? I certainly hope that um, that the Shabak, the Shin Bet, is uh, is active on both, both to prevent Palestinian and Jewish terrorism. Now, what we haven't talked about is the possibility of a multi-front war, which which I think is um, I think the odds are better better than even that we are going to find ourselves at war with Hezbollah and Syria and ultimately Iran. So this, I I think this could lead to a regional war. And it, it depends how successful we are in Gaza. If we really are destroying Hamas, and I think we will, I think it's going to be, we're going to, my, my sense of the ground operation is that it's going to be slow and systematic. And the 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 model that I've heard that the army is is basing itself on is the um, reconquest of the West Bank in 2002 during the Second Intifada. Uh, I forget what it was called uh, in English and Hebrew. It's uh, Chomat Magen, um, defensive shield, Operation Defensive Shield, which was extraordinarily successful. The difference between defensive shield and this operation, or this war, it's not an operation, is that we knew the West Bank. We never really left the West Bank. The Shin Bet was always there. We always had our network of informants. We are going in pretty blind into mm -hmm. Gaza. And, and so I think we're going to proceed with a great deal of caution. And the army feels that, and, and, and we feel this even more strongly after Biden's visit yesterday, which I think was one, the, actually the single most extraordinary moment in the history of the American-Israeli relationship. It was yesterday. And we got the green light from Biden to destroy Hamas. That means we can breathe. We don't have to do things quickly. The problem is, what happens, God forbid, if there really is an accidental Israeli attack on a hospital or a school or whatever it is? Do we will we still have America's support in that same unconditional way? So I I don't feel that time is really on our side. Time is on our side until the first atrocity. And we've Which been here before. Right. It's look, we've been there before. In um in 1996, uh, just before uh, the election that brought Netanyahu to power, Shimon Peres was prime minister, and there was a series of of terror attacks from Lebanon, and we invaded Lebanon, and the operation was going very well militarily, and then there was a stray Israeli shell, one shell, that landed in a school. Where, where several hundred civilians were seeking refuge and something like a hundred people were killed. And there was so much outrage around the world, we had to stop the operation. And then the same thing happened in 2006 during our war with Lebanon. So when you're fighting in these conditions, sooner or later, something is going to happen. And, um, and then the question is, is the war invalid? I personally don't think so. And here for me, the measure of, of moral validity is intent. Mm -hmm. But we know that, that you know, just as the, the explosion at the hospital was able to shift focus and shift, you know, and, and, and enrage the Arab world, that, that amongst the many traps that Hamas has probably set for Israel, is exactly to set them up to either do exactly those kinds of things or make it look like they did those kinds yeah. of things. Um, some other questions that have come up, um, and we'll try to get to all of them. We still have some time. Um, so I, I know there's a question about what happens the day after. I want to put that, I want to put a pin in that. We'll get to that towards the end of the conversation. But I, I do want to talk about the hostages 
And coming back a little bit to the moral question, because there is a, a lot, I've heard this debate within Israel amongst the hostage families about whether or not any humanitarian relief should be allowed into Gaza, whether it's from Egypt or from Israel, uh, with the hostages still being held, whether there should be any sort of, uh, well, what, 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 where are we at with the hostages and, and where is Israel at with it? And is there anything we can do? I mean, we're seeing now um, some public relations campaigns of hostage posters that, that people are posting up around North American cities and around the world, many of which are getting torn down and that's causing, you know, some yeah. confrontations in our streets. Can you talk about that? What makes this war different from any war we've ever fought is that Hamas now has not only Palestinian civilians as a human shield, but Israeli citizens. And I saw an interview the other day on CNN with um, is the IDF's chief spokesperson, Jonathan Conricus. Uh, have you seen him uh, on air? He's, he's quite good. He's, mm -hmm. he's, um, he's one of the best we've had. And uh, Anderson Cooper, it was on CNN, Anderson Cooper asked him, uh, will the presence of the hostages impede Israeli military operations? And his response was, we are committed to the destruction of Hamas's military capabilities. Now, that wasn't a, an answer, mm -hmm. but it was. Mm -hmm. It actually was an answer. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a very hard answer. I think that if you were to ask Israelis in a poll, and I haven't seen a poll like this, what do we do? Do we go ahead? If, what if they start, God forbid, killing hostages? They've mm -hmm. said they would. Mm -hmm. What if they start execute every day that you that you continue this this war? I think the majority, maybe the strong majority, would say, "Go ahead. Mm -hmm. We have to we have to continue because the because the whole country is being held hostage." Mm -hmm. Now think back to 2011 when Gilad Shalit was freed, the Israeli soldier who he we exchanged. He was here in Vancouver, spoke at our shul. Yeah. Gilad Shalit? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, a thousand, we traded a thousand Hamas prisoners for Gilad Shalit, including some of the leaders who helped plan and execute the massacre. At the time, we were all very proud of ourselves. I remember I, you know, I wrote an out, I wrote an out there patting us ourselves on the back. Look how wonderful we are. Look what a wonderful people we are. We we care about life. It's Jewish solidarity. The whole, all of that stuff. And today, what we realize is that sometimes being noble and generous uh has a terrible cost. And it's very counterintuitive to, to, to Jewish instinct. But in, in, in exchanging a thousand prisoners for Gilad Shalit, we're in, a, we're in a situation now where we may, God forbid, have to sacrifice 200 Israeli prisoners. And so weakness has consequences. And I think this is a a, a seminal moment for um, for the Jewish people to 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 ask itself, what are we prepared to do to to defend ourselves? Mm. And that question goes to, the misery we're going to inflict inadvertently, but we are going to inflict on God that we already are inflicting on Gaza civilians, and the toll that we may be forced to to pay with Israeli civilians, Israeli hostages, and this is one of those moments where the Jewish people needs to reown the consequences of power. 
there's something in many Jews, certainly in the diaspora, certainly among liberal Jews, that longs for the innocence or the purity of powerlessness. And I think that the massacre, I think that so many liberal Jews responded to the massacre by embracing Israel again, because, oh, now we can do, now we can embrace Israel because we're the victims of that. But that's not where Israelis were coming from at all. Our, our response was, no, we're actually, we, we actually are not victims. And we're going to do everything we can to change the perception of Israelis as victims. We were victims that day. But that was untenable. And we would rather be condemned than pitied. If I have to sum up the Israeli ethos in one line, that's it. And that's a big psychological difference with a lot of diaspora Jews. I think many diaspora Jews would rather have the world's sympathy than the world's anger. We don't want, we don't want, of course, we want the world's understanding, but I don't want the world's pity. I was very uncomfortable with the outpouring of sympathy and pity for Israel in, in the week after the massacre, because I knew that this was going to turn. And if 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 you if you if you love us and support us uh because we're the victims, in two weeks from now we're not going to be the victims. There are going to be other victims. And we can't win the victimhood contest against the Palestinians. They will always out-victimize us. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to win that contest. I don't ever want to be in the position we were in uh, on October 7. And I will do everything possible, even risk Israel appearing uh, once again as the bully, the aggressor. I will, I much prefer being in that position. You see, you're a journalist and, um, you know, there's a number of questions in the chat about, about world opinion. And I think that, you know, there's social media, which is one kind of crazy corner of the world, but there's the actual media um, that we saw with the, the hospital situation, you know, is, is jumping to be, you know, to be first to to report, you know, aggressions of Israel. And I, I wonder, what do you think is the reason that this is happening in the broader mainstream kind of uh, flagship media? And what does the response need to be of Israel? We, you know, of course, what you're talking about in terms of being comfortable to, to have power is, is one thing. Um, but this world opinion, you know, it does come into play in, in how things are, are perceived and, and it does matter. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, I, I think we have to be very careful when we critique the media, as we must, not to hit the anti-Semitism default button. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's much more complicated than that. Is there some anti-Semitism in the media? Of course there is. When I, when I look at BBC, uh, it reeks of anti-Semitism. Uh, I don't think that by and large, the Western media, is. I don't think the Canadian media by and large or the American media uh, are anti-Semitic. Now, that's not to absolve everyone, but generally. And, and look, you know, I've worked with journalists for, for many decades and um, actually like journalists a lot. I think that 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 journalists tend to go into the profession uh, because they really want to try to um, to 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 help people understand the world, and at the same time, I think that something very damaging has happened to journalism. And I went to journalism school in uh, the late. 1970s uh, in the US, right after Watergate. And that, I think, was a turning point for journalism, certainly in America, uh, in the US. 
And everyone in my class wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein. They wanted to be crusading journalists. And what happened, and I saw this, I saw this, the gap between my classmates and the old timers who were teaching us, these, these the people coming out of the old venerable tradition of journalism. And in some ways they were the last generation of the journalism that was committed to truth. My generation onward were journalists who were committed to justice. Mm. That's a very big difference. Now, the search for truth is always elusive. It's very rare that you're going to, to hit objective truth. But the measure of what used to constitute a, an authentic journalist, a journalist with integrity, was are you committed to searching for the truth? Today, the measure is are you committed to justice? Are you on the right side of a story? Now, that's even more slippery than the search for truth. Even if you can't determine the truth, you have to be committed to searching for the truth. I don't think that journalists today are committed in the same way to searching for the truth. Now, that's not true for, for, for many journalists, but a very large part of the profession has been corrupted by, by a, um, a motive that to my mind betrays the profession. Now, it's interesting because for me personally, I was actually never interested in being that kind of journal. I was never interested in being a, a journalist looking for objective truth. I was never a daily reporter. And I consciously chose to be a feature writer. I wanted to write about people. I wanted to write profiles. And I wanted to tell stories. And you're not expected to be objective. In, you know, I was very interested in what used to be called the new journalism. But the new journalism can't apply to daily journalism. The new journalism belongs in, uh, in, in, in literary nonfiction publications. It doesn't belong in, in your daily newspaper. It doesn't belong on the TV news. Mm. And what's happened is that the new journalism has basically taken over uh, daily journalism. And so what we're seeing, the, the, the rush to judge Israel was, it just seemed to be where the justice of the story was going. Okay, we gave Israel their week in the limelight. We gave them a week of pity. Now, obviously, the pity is shifting to the Palestinians. Well, what about what about truth? Is there any, is, does truth matter? Now, look at the headlines. Look at the way they played the hospital story. The New York Times, banner, mm. banner headline, right? Israel bombs hospital 500 dead. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, it says Palestinians claim. Now, okay, they covered themselves with that, technically. But what's the impression you get, mm -hmm. both by the, the, the inches devoted to, to the headline and those first five or six words? Mm -hmm. Israel bombs hospital 500 dead. Palestinians claim, well, if the Times is running this, as its banner headline, obviously the claim must have substance. And then it turns out the claim has absolutely no substance. A hospital was not bombed, 500 dead. Do you know how long it takes to, to do a body count in a bombed building? Any journalist should have stopped for a moment and said, well, wait a minute, if the hospital is bombed, how do they know 500 are dead? It'll take days to do that count. We just finished our body count yesterday. Yesterday, they, they, they came out with a the, with the final count. And I'm not even sure it's final yet. And so there's this sense of, you know, where's, where's, where's justice? Where's the arc of, I hate that phrase, the arc of justice. Where is the arc of justice pointing? Well, okay, the arc of justice pointed to southern Israel last week. Now the arc of justice has shifted. Okay. You'll see, I, in the time that we have left, it's about 10 minutes or so, I, there's, there's two questions that are on my mind. One is the day after. And, and, I, and I wonder 
if it's even permissible to think about that in the midst of a war, I, I'm reluctant to, but people are asking. And, you know, I would add to that, you know, is there some grand chess game here, some grand political play uh, with all of the various forces that would actually bring some resolution to the, you know, the, the many conflicts that are taking place, the, 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 the many different uh, pressures and alignments that are happening in the region. And then the second question is, what can we do from here? What does Israel need? What can we do as as, as extensions of, of, of the conflict, extensions of the, of the fight for Israel's survival? Here, I think that uh, the day after, the first question that Israel is going to ask is, what is the future of this government? Hmm. We're not going to be looking outward, not initially. Initially, we're going to confront this government and try to bring them down. We cannot continue with this government for another three years. It's inconceivable to me. I will not, I will not have a moment's rest if this government is in power when this war is over. Uh, they're not going to go easily, where it's going to be a very, very hard fight. But I can tell you this. With, with certainty, the day after the war, there will be an explosion of outrage, the likes of which we have never seen in this country. That's the rage that so many of us are, are redirecting now outwardly toward Hamas, that rage is just, that's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the immediate post-war period is going to be an internal confrontation. And it's going to be brutal. Mm. Netanyahu feels absolutely no responsibility for this. You know, and it, it occurred to me the other day, just imagine if the worst terror attack in Israel's history had happened on Naftali Bennett's watch. Mm -hmm what Netanyahu and his loyalists would be saying. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the region, look, we're all going to be waking up to the same reality, Israelis, Palestinians, the Saudis, we're all stuck in the same Middle East. And my hope is that we're going to see a resumption of the Saudi track. And if we can reach a normalization agreement with the Saudis, that's a historic transformation. And in terms of the Palestinians, it's inconceivable right now to imagine Israelis agreeing to a Palestinian state of the West Bank and taking the risk of, of moving Gaza to five minutes from Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. But if we're going for a regional peace. I could see the Palestinian conflict being resolved or trying to resolve it in the context of a regional agreement. And I could see Arab countries applying pressure, not to Israel, but to the Palestinians. Mm. That's a game changer. We've never had Arab allies before. It's, it's, it's extraordinary to even say those words. Israel's Arab allies. The Gulf states, the, the, the Saudis, in some ways feel closer to Israel than they do to the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. there's, there's tremendous rage against the Palestinians. The Saudis hate the Palestinians. And I have that on very good authority. And, and, and I also know that from my own uh, in, involvement with people from the Gulf states, for example, very little sympathy. Now that's not true in other parts of the Arab world. It happens to be true in Saudi Arabia. Maybe that'll change depending how bad things get in Gaza. It could change. But my sense is, that Israel isn't going to be alone anymore in the region. And we might be able to begin thinking of solving the Palestinian issue in the context 
of a of a regional agreement. And um, that's as much as I can allow myself mm -hmm. uh, any measure of of hope for the for the morning after. And to the last question, what can we do from here? What what do you, what do the Israeli people need from us? This is a, um, a very important moment in diaspora Israel relations. Now, it's true that the crisis you know what 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 I've been saying for the last years is that there isn't an an Israel diaspora crisis. There's an Israel American Jewish crisis, or an Israel liberal American Jewish crisis, which isn't true for the rest of the diaspora. I don't think it was really true for Canadian Jewry. Certainly not for Australia, for South Africa, Latin America. Uh, it really was primarily a liberal American Jewish Israel crisis. That's a lot of Jews. Mm -hmm. That's that's probably four or five million Jews. It's it's the overwhelming majority of American Jewry. It's a very, it's a really serious crisis. But I'm very aware of speaking to Canadian Jews at the moment. So I think that the crisis is, was much less. But I do think you did have the beginnings, even in, among Canadian Jewry, of, of a little bit of, of a fraying at the edges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And had this situation continued for another couple of years with this Israeli government, I think that the crisis would have gone deeper mm -hmm. in Canadian Jewry as well. So what's happened now is that we have, we have a moment of grace to try to reset the relationship. And what I want to see is not to go back to the way things were, to the good old days, where the diaspora uncritically supports Israel, and um, and our only responsibility is to accept diaspora support. I want a much more reciprocal relationship because I want the relationship to endure past mm -hmm. our generation, mm -hmm. and and for it to endure, it has to be authentic, and it has to. We have to create mechanisms where diaspora voices are heard, are at the table, are respected. Not, I don't have to adopt all of the criticisms that I hear from diaspora Jews, but I need to hear them. Israelis need to hear them. And, and so that's one thing. And I, I, I don't think that that's relevant right now, but if we're talking about the day after, we need to start thinking more creatively, not just to go back to the way things were. We can't. We 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 had a glimpse into the abyss of diaspora Israel relations, mm -hmm. and we've been and we've been retrieved from that. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a temporary reprieve. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. More immediately, what can you do now? Look up organizations that are doing uh, on the ground. Um, um, work that in many cases the government should be doing. Uh, they, there's a terrific organization called Brothers in Arms. I think you know them, mm -hmm. right? Achim Naneshek. Did they were they the ones who came to to the temple? It was a Baita and uh -huh. uh, so they're Shetaf. doing tremendous work too. Baita Mishutaf and Achim Naneshek, Brothers in Arms. Um, there's a terrific organization uh, called Shaur Shivion, which uh, means the equalizer, and it sets up soccer teams uh, on the Israeli periphery. And they've had lots of teams along the Gaza border, and now they're they're working with with the kids who've been who've been uh, uprooted. I, I happen to know this because my son is the is one of the heads of the organization, and so I've been involved with them for the last few years. And now they're moving all of their activities to the thousands of kids who've been uprooted. And uh, these are the organizations. Um, you know, in addition to federation, that's all That's all fine. And I don't believe in, in, in weakening federation, but I think that, that there also at the same time needs to be outlets for much more personal uh, relationships to, to be created. 
And this is an opportunity for, for deepening personal uh, relations. And I'm, I'm so glad that you, you started a relationship with, uh, with the, uh, with say, uh, Baitha Mishutaf, the Save Our Israel Home movement, which also was a protest movement that pivoted mm -hmm. to a, a, a social action group. And so the fact that you already have a relationship with them, I would urge you to deepen it and uh, ask them, what do you need from us? Mm -hmm. You know, and um, and so this is a time really to be strengthening those personal relations. And um, at the same time, you know, we're fighting a multi-front war. I think it's obviously the media work is crucial. Uh, don't let uh, CBC get away with anything. Uh, don't let the Globe and Mail get away with anything. Uh, I write for them. I I I I I very much like the editors I work with, but don't let them get away with anything. And um, and another front that I briefly mentioned before, which I think is really important, is uh, your relationship with the Muslim communities. You're going to have to live with these people when this is over. And I've done a lot of work. Uh, some of you know the work that Hartman has done over the, these years with um, both American and Canadian Muslim leaders. We, we've had a very strong Canadian Muslim presence in uh, at, at Hartman. And that work is in crisis at the moment. Um, we're all feeling this sense of, of disappointment doesn't quite do it. But we don't have a choice. And I know that there are people of goodwill in the Canadian Muslim community. I've met with people. I've been involved in efforts to jumpstart a uh, Muslim Jewish conversation uh, in, uh, in particular in Toronto. And, and I know that it's possible. It may not be possible at this moment. Uh, although one of the graduates of the Hartman program, the Muslim Leadership Initiative, uh, just convened a meeting of, of rabbis and imams. Mm -hmm. And so it is possible even now. Now, I say this to you to do this work without illusion. We're not going to hear from most Muslims what we need to hear in the most elementary way an unequivocal revulsion. It it almost always will come with a but. Look what you're doing. Okay, let's condemn together. We'll condemn the massacre of all innocents. And uh, I'm not ready to play that game. So I don't know if there's anything to be done right now, but the morning after, I think this really needs to be on, on your radar. Yossi, thank you so much. This is um, just so incredibly helpful to us. And uh, we are just so grateful for your time. We know how much you are pulled in so many directions. And we appreciate the relationship that we have with you. Um, well, I do too. I do too. And I'm I'm very grateful for the friendship and the support. And, um, and I look forward to, uh, to developing the relationship over the, the coming months, both long distance and then we hope to be in Vancouver uh, in the spring. So right. we will hopefully make this uh, in person. Yeah, we'd love to so, go uh, back to talking just that. about democracy. <laughs> but, or not. <laughs> but, uh, the, day, yeah. the day after the war, we're right. back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll have a recording of this up uh, in the next couple of hours, and we'll try to put some links to some of the organizations that we've mentioned here as well. Yossi, stay safe. and. Thank uh, you. And our best to everyone there. Thanks so much. Take okay. care, everyone. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Thank you.